a lecture on water policy, uh, including subcontinental water policy <laughs> at, at the BUE, the one that gave me a doctorate. So. <coughs> okay, welcome. This is the tea time slot. This is going to be an active uh, group. Uh, I'm going to hope, I hope that all of you will contribute to the discussion. I don't know if how many of you were here this morning, but uh, the moderators were enjoined to try and make sure two things happened in each of these sessions. Number one, that they resulted in some practical suggestions and recommendations. And number two, that opinions were aired. Uh, in other words, we really get people's uh, views out on the table. My name is Michael Keating. I'm the director of the Africa Progress Panel. The panel is a group of very eminent people, African and otherwise, uh, supporting political, economic and uh, social progress in Africa, chaired by Kofi Annan, which probably explains why I've been asked to moderate. Uh, I have a very distinguished panel here. We have one panel member missing, that's uh, Shabazz Khan, but he may uh, appear. Uh, a very gender balanced group, I have to say, uh, but we will... We will we will speak for, for everyone. I'll be the girl. You can be the girl, right? Uh, <laughs> we have uh, Ashok uh, Korsler, who is the Director General of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, Roger Martin, uh, Chair of Trustees of the uh, Optimum Population Trust. And Aubrey Mayer, Director of the Global Commons Institute. Now, um, I was asked to make a few opening points just to get the ball going, and I'll try and do that, if only to provoke, uh, provoke things. By the way, we've agreed in an order, which uh, it's been a sort of bit of a unilateral agreement, I'm afraid. We're going to, I think, uh, uh, Roger, I may ask you to speak first, in okay. fact, if that's all right, then Aubrey, and then uh, Ashok. Uh, let me just make a few opening propositions, and uh, you know, if you disagree with them, Hold tight, because you'll have a chance to refute them later on. The first is that the Earth's capacity is finite. There are limits. The second is that unless current trends change radically, the world's population is going to uh, grow to about 9 billion by the year, I think, 2050. The world's population will actually triple in my lifetime if I live to about 80. Uh, more people, a, th a third proposition is that more people means uh, greater global problems. Even though, as Barbara Stocking said this morning, uh, you know, the bulk of the world's population has not caused the problem of climate change. But the, the big proposition is that the more people there are, the bigger the problem we're facing. Uh, we need to bring greenhouse gases down to a sustainable level, and the principle of equity has to inform this reduction. So what we're aiming for is equal allocation on a per capita basis, both as the only political, politically acceptable way forward and as providing the basis for, for practical action. If that is accepted, and it's a big question hovering over this conference, I think, as to whether that proposition is accepted, then there are a number of major practical implications. And the question I think we're being asked to address today, panel members and <coughs> participants, is, you know, what are the implications of this for population management? At least that's my interpretation of what we're being asked to address. Um, you know, and one of the questions in the blurb, in the brochure, is could this lead to perverse uh, incentives to actually increase population in some parts of the world? Personally, I doubt it, but that's a question we've been asked to think about. The question I would add is are there also opportunities here? You know, for example, for poorer countries to access financial and techno te technical resources by you know, uh, taking a certain path within an agreed uh, regime or uh, uh, equitable per capita cap. Now, I'm not going to dwell upon the impact of climate on people. I think we've heard a lot about that. But clearly, you know, uh, 
it impacts everything from food production, food security, health, disease management, natural resource management, um, uh, water, uh, and other infrastructure. Uh, and it, as usual, uh, you know, women and children tend to be the most vulnerable to uh, development, de-development, and to development trends, uh, unless unless things are done to prevent to, to, to support them. So let, let let me just throw that out and leave you with the question: you know, what are what are the relationships between population management, population growth, and climate change? And I hope that will lead into your uh, presentation. Uh, and it's over to you. That's fine. And do I have your permission to berate you after five minutes? You if do. only so, so that, I mean, I've had one request for a slightly longer presentation, which I'm able to, uh, to accommodate because there's only, uh, because we're missing the fourth speaker. And uh, Ashok has actually prepared a presentation, which I hadn't realized. So I think we will hear that at the end. But over to you. Okay, thank you. Well, um, is this on? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm Roger Martin, I'm Optimum Population Trust, and since the opening plenary this morning, there are 70,000 more people in the world than there were this morning, all requiring water, food, energy, land, and producing waste and pollution. And I was very glad to hear Barbara Stocking and uh, Margaret Chan this morning admitting that there was not a single problem addressed by this conference this year or last which would not be easier to solve with fewer people or harder and ultimately impossible with more. And this applies on the climate change side both in terms of rich countries where every additional rich kid adds to the cl gl climate changing causing problem and every additional poor kid adds to a future person to suffer and in the future fair world that we hope to achieve by mid-century if we get there we want everyone to, to be converged and contracted around one but every additional every extra person not born at by that stage every person less means that there's more carbon left for the rest of us so Every person is a future carbon consumer, and any reduction of future carbon mm. consumption is what this is about. Now, there's a dangerous delusion around that when the laws of physics conflict with those of justice, uh, the, uh, the latter should prevail, but it's not true, so it won't happen. And since we know that the planet is finite, we know it can't sustain infinite growth, and the population growth will therefore stop one day. We all know it. We also should know that when it stops, it will stop in one of two ways or a combination. That is either the humane way by fewer births, which is contraception backed by policy, or the natural way, which is more deaths, which is famine, disease, war, and catastrophe. There is no third choice of indefinite growth. It is physically impossible. So um, we all know that it's easier to feed two kids with one dollar a day than ten kids. We all know it's easier to supply drinking water to one million than to ten million people in a dry country, to protect forests and fisheries, biodiversity and commons, if we have the fewer people making claims on it, or a stable number making claims on it, rather than ever more. And it's more energy and CO2 to provide, uh, provide energy to a city of uh, a million people than of, than of five million. In other words, we all know that all environmental impacts are an average of individual or a mixture, um, a, a, a combining average uh, emissions per ter impact per person times number of people. And we all know, therefore, that every extra person ratchets up pressure on the planet, as a matter of fact, not opinion, and ratchets down the individual share of natural resources left to us all. Now, we all know that, but many people do deny that the numbers are important even though, of course, we all admit, and the conference is all about, the fact that the rich do more damage. What consideration is there given in Copenhagen to this issue? The answer is none. They talk about new technologies and so on, and new market schemes. But 43% of all pregnancies in the world, according to UNFPA, are unwanted pregnancies. These are the poorest, most oppressed people in the world with no control over, the, over their own fertility. If only we could empower those poor women to take control and enable them to take control of their own fertility, 